except him. The glory and honor belongs to Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. The title of our message today is, I am free. Yes. It's actually a euphoric shout. Uh, you don't say this as, I am free. It's like, you're free. You're not going to the electric chair. So, <laughs> so you're not like, I am free. It's like when you say, hallelujah. You don't say, hallelujah. No, you say, hallelujah. Uh, you're not like the pastor who comes. So you remember that pastor who comes to the pulpit with stoop shoulders, and then he comes and say, I, our message today is the joy of the Christian life. Now, this one, you say, the joy of the Christian life. This one is, I am free. You're excited, you're thrilled, you're ecstatic, because this is good news, amen? I am free. Uh, this is good news, but it's a double-edged sword, if you will. So it's good news, but there's a bad news side to it. Uh, I'm reminded of the story of a group of soldiers who marched into a thick tropical jungle for three days as part of their training. At the end, they were tired, they were sweaty, and they were dirty all over. And the surgeon said to them, I've got good news and I've got some bad news for you. The good news is you're all going to have a change of underwear. And one of the soldiers asked, what is the bad news, sir? Well, you have to change underwear with each other. <laughs> so, many of life's situation is a bad news, uh, good news situation. For example, if you receive a promotion from your job, that means an increase in salary. But it also means an increase probably of responsibilities, an increase in working hours. Or if your boss praise you for a job well done, he may also tell you off for a lousy job in another. January 26th for the British colonizers is Foundation Day, the birth of a nation, but to the Aborigines, it's Invasion Day, the death of their nation. So good news bad news. Being free is good news and bad news. It's a positive fact, I'm free, but it implies a negative truth. To be set free means it indicates that you've been imprisoned or enslaved or there are things that keep people in bondage and in chains. Now, in this message, we're going to talk about things that keep people in chains and how to break free from these chains in order to be free. We're going to look at a passage in the Gospel of John, which I'm sure most of us are familiar with. In fact, one of these verses is often quote, quoted by even people who don't actually read the Bible. John chapter 8, verse 31. We're not going to read the whole chapter, just a part of, the, of it. John 8, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. Now let me give you the setting for this conversation. And Jesus was in the temple in Jerusalem. He just finished proclaiming before that, that he was the promised Messiah. The Messiah that has been prophesied by the prophets years, hundreds of years before. And he also proclaimed that he was, he is the light of the world. And those who follow him will not walk in darkness, but they will have the light of life. Now the religious leaders, the Pharisees challenged that. 
In fact, they accused him of being a false witness. And so there was animosity and there was more uh, hatred, if you will, uh, uh, towards Jesus because of what he claimed he was. But there in the crowd, while Jesus was teaching that, amongst the crowd, there were people who were listening who initially believed his arguments rather than the Pharisees. And these are the people that Jesus is addressing here. Now, in our text, it says that they believed in him. But this is not real saving faith. This is mental assent, not heart belief. And if you read through to the end of this chapter, you will see that some of them actually accused him of having a demon and even tried killing him by stoning him. So this was not real faith. But they believed at least in what he said who he was. And this is who Jesus is addressing in this passage. He's telling them, what it is or what's the requirement of a true believer and a true disciple of his. Now, there are three things that Jesus said in this passage which relates to freedom from bondage that I want to highlight. I'm not going to talk about three of them today, just two, and we'll finish our discussion next Sunday. The first one is, you are not free. Repeat with me. You are not free. And this is what Jesus said to the Jews, again in verse 31. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now, Jesus implies that the Jews were not free. If to know the truth is to be free then obviously before you believed in the truth, you were not free. Does that make sense? Amen? If the truth sets you free, so prior to believing or hearing the truth, it means that you were not free. And if you are not free, then you are enslaved by someone or enslaved by something. This is what he was implying. And the Jews took offense. They were not just irritated, they were upset. And so they answered him, what are you talking about? We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? What Jesus said to the Jews is like telling the Australians or telling all the Australians that they are not free. If you go out into the street and tell someone, hey mate, I have an important thing to tell you. You think you're free, right? Yes, of course. But you're not. It's the truth that will set you free. I'm sure that guy would probably think that you're nuts. Uh, maybe the guy would just walk away or maybe he would tell you, what are you talking about? I'm not free. We live in a free country. We have freedom of religion. We have freedom of speech and all kinds of freedom. And look, I'm not in a jail. I'm free as a bird. And so what are you talking about that I'm not free? The same was the thinking of the Jews. And so they said, how dare you? They were saying to Jesus, how dare you say that we are not free? We've never been slaved. Uh, we are not slaves now, and we've never been slave, enslaved by anyone. We are descendants of Abraham. You know him, right? Uh, we were never enslaved by anyone. And that was their response to Jesus Christ. Now, there's a teacher who said to, his, to her uh, students, class, our subject today is history. I'd like to ask you a question. Who killed Abraham Lincoln? And of course, like in the class, if I ask you who killed Abraham Lincoln, uh, you look at your shoes, right? <laughs> Afraid that I might call you. Come here, come here, answer the question. Who killed Abraham Lincoln? Everybody, every student was looking at, you know, fidgeting on their notebook. And, but there was one particular student at the back who was hiding behind their class, his classmates. And the teacher saw him and said, P, 
Peter, why are you hiding behind your classmates? Stand up. Stand up. Answer my question. Who killed Abraham Lincoln? And Peter sort of like was very nervous. And I said, what's wrong with you? Why are you so nervous? And Peter stammered, uh, 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 Mom, Mom, I didn't kill uh, Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> I don't even know him. <laughs> well, in a, sense, in a sense, the Jews forgot their history. It's true that they were children of Abraham. And you know who Abraham was, right? Abraham was a giant in the faith. He's our father in the faith. It was to Abraham that God promised that he will be a blessing to many nations. God promised to him that his descendants, that his, the Jews, are going to be as numerous as the stars in the heaven. And it's true that the Jews were the most fortunate, if you will, special people on the face of the earth because of Abraham. But it is not true that they were never enslaved. In their history, they were enslaved by Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Greece, and at that time, Rome. And so it's not wholly true that they were never enslaved. And that is why Jesus said, well, you think you're free? You're not. And he answered them, very truly I tell you, verse 34, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. And Jesus wasn't referring to a political bondage. He was referring to a spiritual bondage. If he was referring to a political bondage, then he would simply have reminded the Jews of their history. But he didn't do that. Rather, he explained the real reason why they and all of us are not free. And that is because all of us are slaves to sin. Amen? We're all slaves to sin because everyone sins. Now, who among us is so brazen enough to say that you've never committed sin in your entire life? Can you raise your hand? If you raise your hand, we will crucify you. I've got a, some nails there and some hammer. If you raise your hand, we will crucify you. Jesus was sinless and he was crucified, remember? Now, none of us can claim that we've never sinned. All of us are slaves to sin because all of us sins. One man said, I never made a mistake in my life. I thought I did once, but I was wrong. <laughs> A pretentious college professor was talking to a man whose car broke down at the side, by the side of the road. And he was trying to explain what's wrong with his car. And he goes like this. Sir, your pneumatic contrivance has ceased to function. Your pneumatic contrivance has ceased to function. The man was dumbfounded. He said, by what? The professor said, I say your tubular air container has lost its rotundity. The man said, I don't understand. The professor said, the elastic fabric surrounding the circular frame whose successive revolutions bear you onward has not retained its roundness. A small boy was listening to the whole thing said, oh, mister, he meant you have a flat tire. <laughs> Jesus didn't beat around the bush. He didn't cover the ugly reality of sin by nice sounding words. He said it straight. Everyone sins. Every one of you. No one is exempted. That's why everyone is a slave to sin. The Apostle Paul said that all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. Amen? Amen. This means that you can have the greatest civil liberties available. You can enjoy living 
and enjoying the benefits and the blessings of the freest country on earth. You can go where you want to go. You can do whatever you want to do. You can think whatever you want to think. You can say whatever you want to say. And you can write whatever you want to write. And you can own whatever you want to own. And you can live however you want to live. Yet still be a slave under the most oppressive and the most horrible bondage there is, the bondage to sin. It's the most horrible, the most oppressive bondage because sin destroys not just the body, but the soul. Amen? Now Jesus said, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. When we commit sin, we are a slave to sin. We yield to that sin. Are you following me? We submit to that sin because of the pleasure we experience from it. And so we become slaves of our passions and pleasures. And we know that there are a lot of things that can enslave us. Because it gives us pleasure. We can be a slave to drugs. We can be a slave to gambling. We can be a slave to alcohol, to cigarettes. We can be a slave to food, right? We sleep too much and we eat too much. Someone said, I eat cake every day because it's somebody's birthday somewhere. <laughs> a good excuse. I eat cake every day because it's someone's birthday somewhere. Happy birthday. So it's somebody's birthday. <laughs> Another person said, the fatter you are, the harder you are to kidnap. So stay safe. Eat cake. <laughs> A woman told her friend, you know, I went to see an acupuncturist. What for? Well, to cure my craving for cakes. And her friend asked, did it work? Absolutely. How? And she said, the acupuncturist stuck needles in the cakes so I could not eat them. <laughs> uh, good idea. Now, if you have a habit and you find it hard to quit, you find it hard to break that habit, it means it has controlled you. You are a slave to that habit. The Apostle Paul said this, 1 Corinthians 6, 12. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It says, you say, I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. And even though I am allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. Maybe some of us today in this room are imprisoned by some addiction or a sinful habit that you can never get rid of. You try to help yourself. You try to free yourself from them. You made resolutions. I don't want to do it again. And yet you find yourselves doing it again. You know what that is? Slavery. Someone made this New Year's resolution for 2020. His resolution was complete the resolutions I set in 2019 <laughs> that were actually from 2018, passed down from 2017, originally from 2016, actually set in 2015, that all began in 2014, but truly started in 2013. <laughs> Do you remember the movie uh, Lord of the Rings? Yes. How many of you saw that movie? Do you remember that character Gollum? Yes. And how he was so obsessed with the ring? He called it my precious. My precious. He was so obsessed with the ring that eventually it destroyed him. The lesson that we get from the story of Golem is that what you seek to possess is in fact 
possessed you. Amen? What you seek to possess is in fa- has in fact possessed you. What we want to consume has consumed us. We have become prisoners of that we seek to obtain. You remember that story of the rich young man in Matthew 19, verse 16 to 24? And we're not going to go there, but you probably have come across that passage of Scripture. The rich young man who said to Jesus, I want to follow you. And Jesus said, okay, you want to follow me? Go sell your possessions. And then use the money and give it to the poor. The man walked away because he can't walk away from his money. He was controlled by his money. More than his love for the Lord. And this love of money eventually, this love of money eventually makes us lose control of how we spend our money. And that is why even Christians end up being in bondage to debt. One, because we don't control our spending habits. We spend more than we earn, more than the, our means of income. And that is why our, some of us, our motto is, I owe, I owe, I owe. So off to work I go. Why do we end up in that position? Because we don't live according to our means. There was this old lady driving a BMW car and she was about to park in a space, a parking space available when suddenly a young man driving a sports car well, parked ahead of her. And so when the young man came out, out, out from his car, the woman uh, called him and he said, what, what are you doing? And the young man said, well, because I'm young and I'm quick. And the, uh, the old lady as the young man was walking away, the old lady stepped on her accelerator and drove towards the young man's car. Boom! And it, he destroyed the car. And the young man looked at the old woman and said, what are you doing? And the old woman said, because I'm old and I'm rich. <laughs> well, if you're old and rich, you can spend more than you can earn. But if you're old and poor, then you have to live according to your means. Amen? You know, the most common reason I, the most common reason that uh, people go into debt is because they want to pretend to be someone else they are not. It's like they are emulating the lifestyles of their neighbors or friends or relatives. They want to keep up with the Jonases. Well, if they have it, so should I. I'm more talented, even more educated than them. So why can't I have what they have? And so they end up in a bondage of debt. The problem with debt, of course, is that it has to be paid, right? It's good. It's easier to get some debt, more difficult to pay it. But if we actually live according to our means, we should have less anxiety and more freedom with our family and our life. Amen? And the second reason is because they don't control their cravings. They don't control their cravings. They want it now. Uh, whatever it is that they crave, they want it now. They w- don't wait for the right time. They want the car now. They want the holiday now. They want the house now. They want the appliance now. They want the rewards now, not later. They want the pleasures now, not later. All sense of priorities is gone because we want what we want now. And if our passions, our pleasures rule instead of priorities, then our passions imprisons us. We create our own prison, isn't it? Amen? We create our own prison. We create our own problems. 
We create a world of our own making that enslave us. Because we have become controlled by our passions and our appetites and pleasures. But here's the good news. You can be free. That's the next point. You can be free. If you want to be free. If the son of man, the son sets you free. You can be free. Amen? Question, do you want to be free? Do you want to be free from... An addiction, a bondage, a sin, a habit. Or you can be free. How? I'll put it this way. Let go and let God. Let go and let God. Let me explain it in, a, in an illustration that I probably shared to you before. It's about a documentary of a tribe in Africa and how they catch monkeys what they do is that they look for a hollowed lug and then they bore a hole maybe two inches in diameter and then after that they put inside that hollowed lug they bore a hole if this is the lug it is hollow here they bore a hole here on top about two inches in diameter and they placed a tempting fruit inside and then that's the trap. They wait for the monkey. Now you think like, well, that's not a very effective trap. Yes, you're right. But you see, this trap carries with it, the lethal part of this trap is actually with the monkey. And this is how it works. Now, Presumably, the monkey would be because they're the most, one of the most intel, intelligent animals in the animal kingdom, right? The monkeys. Uh, and so presumably, the monkeys would be watching the natives prepare their, uh, their trap. And they will be looking, they will be uh, on the treetops and watching how these foolish human beings, are, what their foolish human beings are doing. And they see this fruit. And the natives placing it in the log. And then the natives would go away. And the monkeys would look around if to see the coast is clear. If the natives are gone, but actually just hiding somewhere. Waiting for the monkeys to come down. But the monkeys would be looking around and see no one. And so they come down from the tree, go to the log. Look as a... In, investigate whether there's a wire or rope that would latch onto their hand and seeing nothing they would dip their hand into the hole and into to get the fruit inside the lug and that's how they get trapped and you say what they can easily get or escape right right how they can simply let go because the hole is only big enough for their hands, but not if they're holding the fruit. So they have to let go of the fruit so they can escape. And so while they are struggling to get the fruit, and they can't because the hole is not that big, the natives will come out from their hiding and then catch the struggling animal and you ask the question did the monkey have the fruit or did the fruit have the monkey the fruit had the monkey right because he can he can escape the trap if he can if he would only let go but he wouldn't The application for us is this. What is it that has made a monkey out of you? <laughs> that thing that has trapped you. That thing that has caused you or has chained you and put you in bondage. But you are not willing to let go. You're like the little monkey. You're praying to the Lord, Lord help me. Deliver me from this temptation. Deliver me from this woman, this man, Lord. 
You're struggling to be free, but you're not willing to let go. Are you with me? And God is not going to remove those things, brethren. God is not going to remove those things unless you let go. Amen? To be free, you have to be willing to let go. So I ask you the question, are you willing to be free or do you want to be free? You can be free, but you have to let go. And then let God set you free. Amen? What is it that you are not willing to let go? And that's the thing that is keeping you in bondage. That's the thing that is keeping you as an addict. You're addicted to it because you're not willing to let go. I remember my friend, he was addicted to a cigarette. And he kept on blaming others about his inability to drop the habit. And I finally said to him, well, you only have to let go. You only have to quit. Nobody is forcing you. That's your decision. And then God will do the rest. Amen? If you're not willing... God is not going to remove that thing, that addiction from you. Let go and let God. Let Jesus free you from the bondage of sin, from the consequences of sin, even from the power of sin. We are slaves to sin, and by ourselves we can't do anything about it. But with God, with Jesus, that's why he said, if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. So Jesus is saying, today, this time is the day that you leave slavery. You leave that bondage. This time is freedom. You can say, I am free. Just like many people whom Jesus Christ have freed before. Amen? No matter how powerful that sin is, no matter how powerful that addiction is, God's power is still greater. So if the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. Let's bow our heads in prayer and we'll continue with this next Sunday. Father, I don't know if some of us here are struggling with something that we know are maybe destroying our testimony as Christians or destroying our lives or our future. But it's the pleasure that we derive from this sin that's keeping us holding it. 